You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are gearing up for the Institute on Liturgy, Preaching, and Church Music taking place July 9th through 12th in Seward, Nebraska this summer. And we have another one of the keynote speakers. And I'm excited because we get to dig into more about the Psalms today Mm -hmm. and learn a little bit more about some of the keynote speakers as well at the Institute. So thanks so much to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, the Reverend Dr. Adam Hensley, Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. He is also one of the keynote speakers for the Institute on Liturgy, Preaching, and Church Music, taking place July 9th through the 12th. Dr. Hensley, welcome to the Coffee Hour. Thank you. To be here. It's good to have you on the Coffee Hour, and welcome to St. Louis. You're fairly new to Concordia St. Louis. Uh, How long have you been at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis now? Yes, I've been here since uh, the beginning of this academic year. So I started last fall teaching classes in the Psalms. It's been a great opportunity to get deeper into my wheelhouse there and I enjoy sharing on the Psalms with particularly fourth years here and classes on Isaiah and um, wisdom literature and, and more general overviews of the Old Testament, that kind of thing. So yes, I've been been here for that for this first academic year and been enjoying very much the engagement with, with all our students, both pastoral students and diaconal and, and, and those in other kinds of programs. So it's been very good. Now, I grew up here in Missouri, and I even spent a lot of time in southeast Missouri, but I don't recognize the accent. Is, is that western Missouri? That ac- no, no, it's a southern accent, actually. It's, yeah, southern it's a very southern accent. Uh-huh. Yes, got, to, got to go a fair, fair bit south. Yes, Australia, of course. I am a, well, I grew up in Melbourne, actually, Melbourne, Australia, which is at the very southern point of the main continent of Australia. So, yes, it's about as south as you can get. <laughs> funny. <laughs> so the the institute this summer is all about the psalms and you just said you get to teach on the psalms. So this is I'm guessing this is something you find a lot of enjoyment in teaching and and looking into the psalms. What do you what what do you love about the psalms and really getting into them digging into them? Yeah, I I I had the opportunity to study the psalms in depth. That was the main subject of my doctoral dissertation. I worked on particularly on the arrangement of the psalms not just individual psalms, we're so used to hearing them individually, aren't we? But appreciating the whole book of psalms, the the theology of the book of psalms as they are brought together in the way they are, was something that I always wanted to, to learn more about. And, and this was a great opportunity to do that. So for me, probably the greatest joy is is seeing how the individual psalms and the theology in them, their wonderful witness to to Christ, is amplified by the way in which they are arranged within the book of the Psalms. And you see that in so many different ways, just just with specific Psalms and specific examples. And it's some of that that I want to get into, particularly at the, the Institute. It's going to be, be fun to kind of unpack that. I get to do that with my students here at Concordia. And yeah, it's, it's a really wonderful area to explore further. Tell us more about your your study of the Psalms, your research on the Psalms, and what particularly triggered this interest in how the Psalms are arranged. Yes, I I was when it comes to the, the basic driving question that I was asking, it was really concerning the the status or the way in which the Davidic covenant is understood in the book of Psalms. So so much of the Psalms are about David, right? We think of King David as the sweet psalm singer of Israel and because he is. I mean, this is the way he's, he's spoken of in Second Samuel. And and yet, you know, just appreciating how the whole theology of the Davidic kingship plays out in the book of Psalms. This was an area of, of great, really, discussion and, and, and debate in the Psalms as they've been studied in recent years. I didn't really appreciate just how much... Uh, that the shape of the book of Psalms and the shaping, the process by which they became a book as opposed to just a lot of individual Psalms, uh, had dominated some scholarship until I got into this further. And as one of uh, my professors here, I did my graduate studies through Concordia Seminary, so I'm a graduate of, of, of CSL as well. Dr. Reed Lessing, he, he pointed me in this direction. He said, look, this is a, a, a burgeoning area of study. You might like to get into that. And 
So I did, and and I discovered very quickly just how burgeoning it was. It's there's been an explosion of scholarly literature on the the shape and shaping of the Psalms in the last thirty or forty years, and and really now the the the, the depth of the theology of the Psalms is being appreciated more and more with as this work comes out. So I was particularly interested in this question of the Davidic covenant and particularly how it was understood by those who compiled the Psalter. In relation to the other covenants we read about in the Bible, I'm thinking particularly of the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant with Abraham. We see particularly in the Genesis 12 that being introduced, and and then the Sinai covenant, or more broadly, one might talk of the Mosaic covenant, the covenant mediated by Moses between God and Israel, and and how that looks. So there were scholars saying that uh, that the Davidic covenant had kind of failed. You know that this was a a hope that was held high in the time of the monarchy, but once exile came along, well, then, you know, they kind of realized that wasn't going anywhere because they had no king anymore. So they turned to the Mosaic Covenant in particular as sort of the focus of of life in the post-exilic period. This was the the accounting of these questions that was being given in the literature at the time. And I actually argued for the opposite move, (laughs) that whereas in the Psalter, you know, we we see a lot of, of the Mosaic Covenant there for sure, and, and the kind of Mosaic Covenantal concerns, such as the, the Ten Commandments, they're echoed in many places there in the Psalter. And we see the importance of Israel as a, a people who are called to be faithful to God's word and so forth. But what I saw going on was sort of the reverse move, where the, the people and the nation's failure to keep this covenant would be remedied by the coming of a faithful king that is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant and its promises. So that really the covenantal theology of the Old Testament finds its common fulfillment in the expectation of a coming messianic king. And so kingship is spoken of in the Psalms in very ideal ways. It's idealized, we might say, so as to give us the blueprint of who this Messiah would be, a faithful keeper of God's Torah, one who meditates on God's Torah, just as Deuteronomy 17 talks about, that the perfect king, what, what, what the righteous king, what's the righteous king to do? Well, to meditate on God's Torah and to, to be faithful to it, to be not above his brothers and all of this sort of stuff. But not only that, a, a king who would intercede for his people, even suffer for his people. And we see this kind of picture of kingship build over the Psalms, as particularly as we move into the later books of Psalms. Your hearers may be aware that the Psalter is not really one book, but five books, five smaller sections that comprise the whole book of Psalms as we know it. And it's in those later books that some of this comes out more fully, where we get to see the picture of kingship in this idealized messianic vision. And that, of course, is is how, in a, in a broad sense, the book of Psalms bear witness to the coming Christ. Yeah, this picture of this picture of Jesus as king is one of those pictures that the Psalms give us about Christ. What are some of the other pictures that we find in Psalms that, that tell us about Christ? Mm. Well, of course, Christ's threefold office as prophet, priest, and king are all there in the Psalms. We see this quite powerfully in certain places. As priest, of course, go straight to Psalm 110. You are a priest forever. You know, the promise there, addressed to David's Lord, as David is a type of the coming Davidic king to come, whom he calls Lord. And Jesus speaks this way, of course, doesn't he, in, in Matthew? And uh, saying this, how can, how can he be his son? How can he be David's son? If he calls him Lord, he's greater than that, in other words. This is the coming king is greater than David, not just someone even just like David. So there's this relationship between David as a type, uh, a figure of the coming Christ who is the antitype, the great fulfillment of all that God had promised in and through and to David. So we get that picture of, of the coming Messiah as a not just a king, but as a priest. But we also see, hear him speaking prophetically, I think of Psalm 102 here, particularly where Psalm 102 is actually a lament, by the way. So the picture is of really the Davidic king who is suffering and 
just even describes himself as like this lonely bird on a rooftop, this very kind of fragile figure. So a wonderful kind of witness to the, 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 the Christ who's come down for us and who suffered for us. But in that psalm, he announces the time of God's compassion on Zion. And in the, those words, it's, it's around about verses 14, 15 in that psalm, he, he is prophetically announcing God's mercy and grace. And you get to the next psalm, Psalm 103, and he's revealing that grace, that gracious, compassionate nature of God that we first learn about or earlier than Exodus 32, 34, really. But in Exodus 34, God himself had said, you know, that he is a God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Well, you find these same words in Psalm 103. So David not only, or the, the future David, the greater David to come, I would suggest, is not only uh, prophetically announcing the time of God's favor and mercy on Zion as something that, that would come, he then actually speaks that mercy and grace as a mouthpiece of God. Of course, that's what a prophet is. One who is the mouthpiece of God. So actually, this is a testimony to the way the Psalms are arranged and how important that is for getting to the depths of the Psalter's whole witness to Christ, that it isn't just about the individual Psalms, but about the way the Psalms are connected to each other. And we've just talked about two adjacent Psalms, two that have been very deliberately put together, Psalm 102 and 103. And we could add to that too, but there's so many, many things we could say about the way individual psalms are related, but they all bear this same kind of message and and help us to see the Messiah in his fullness. We're getting a preview of what you can learn at the Institute on Liturgy, Preaching, and Church Music today, taking place July 9th through 12th in Seward, Nebraska. Our guest is the Reverend Dr. Adam Hensley, Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. We'll continue the conversation of the coffee hour in just a moment. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live Uncommon. Sharing our faith can sometimes be hard, especially face-to-face. That's one of the reasons KFUO is here, to share God's Word globally on your behalf and to equip you with the knowledge, confidence, and words to share Jesus yourself. This share make a gift to KFUO Radio so we can continue sharing Christ to the world. Donate online at kfuo.org slash share That's kfuo.org slash share Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Today we're getting a preview of what you can learn at the Institute on Liturgy, Preaching, and Church Music, July 9th through 12th in Seward, Nebraska, with the Reverend Dr. Adam Hensley, Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Digging into the Psalms today, we're talking about how the Psalms are arranged and pictures that you might find in the Psalms. Uh, now, having studied the Psalms so in-depthly and looking at how they are arranged, and uh, you were just speaking about some of the pictures that we see in the Psalms of, of, of Christ and the King, how does this, how does your understanding of the Psalms shape your preaching, your teaching as a professor, and even your devotional life? Yeah, it, I think it, the kind of... It, the imminence of presence of Christ in our midst. I think if you think about Christ, how he actually interacts with us through the divine service. You know, we, we have a God who, who provides his own mediator to us to bridge that gap between God and man. And, and it's him. It's Christ. It's God, the son in the flesh who's, who's done it. So we, everything we experience in divine service as we, we come and receive the Lord's Supper, as we hear preaching, as we receive absolution, and we in turn offer our prayers, praises, and thanksgiving is in and through Christ. So the pictures that we've been 
talking about here a little bit, actually gel with that reality that we live on a weekly basis and on a daily basis in our devotional lives as we we receive the Heavenly Father as our own Father in and through Christ. So the Psalms, as they build this picture for us and help us to to see Christ for who he is, are, are really teaching us about the, the way in which we experience God himself in Christ to us, coming down and serving us on a, in a regular basis. So, I mean, the, the Bible, the, the Psalms are called, or Luther called the, the, the Psalms a mini Bible for a reason. Like the, the whole theology of the scriptures really is is wrapped up and summarized in this book. So I found the Psalms particularly helpful in this way as I've thought more deeply about that, about the liturgical theology and about our just living Christian life and the way in which God nourishes us in this Trinitarian way. The Father, we receive the Father's blessing through the Son in the Christ and by the Spirit. In terms of my devotional life, yeah, I mean, think about the the, the variety of Psalms that we have in terms of their their genre, you put it that way, but their function. We have prayers that are deeply from a hurting soul. You know, these these laments that that give voice to the sorts of ex- things that we experience in life that maybe if we were left to ourselves, we simply couldn't find words for. But what a God we have who gives us words for those very things, puts words in our mouths that we might speak back to him. And so he invites us to lament. You know, we don't just pray when things are going well, you know, when we have things to be thankful for. We oftentimes are moved to prayer at those moments in our lives when when we are most struggling, when the, the crises come crashing down on us and we, we realize our need, need all the more powerfully. Well, it's in those moments too that God just doesn't show us the need for him and, and prayer to him, but he gives us words to pray. These, I would say, the Psalms give us voice as we we lay our need before God, and and very honestly too. We don't need to, as I like to say to my students, we don't need to put on our spiritual makeup and sort of present ourselves in a certain way before we dare bring our need before God. You know, as if we've somehow got to write ourselves or get ourselves into a certain frame of mind. And we come just as I am, as the hymn goes, and just as we are. Whether the crisis is internal, it's a crisis of conscience as, as we're convicted of our sin, or whether the, the crises are external. And, you know, the, there are other pressures and other assaults that we're experiencing from the outside. The Psalms have, have both kinds of crises covered in all sorts of ways. Well, God also gives us voice when it comes to praising him and giving him thanks. Think of all the thanksgivings that we, we experience in the Psalms as we speak them back to God, all the praises. How do you praise God? We praise God by using the praises that he's given us to do. Much as Jesus taught his disciples to pray when he when they asked him, how do you pray? Well, he gave them a prayer. He gave them his own prayer, the Lord's Prayer, that we, we of course, use. And so in many various ways, I find the Psalms are just integral to the devotional life and the prayer life. Whether we're thinking individually, in terms of my individual life and you know, your individual devotional life or corporately as we use the psalms in our public worship and speak them together on a regular basis praying them or or giving praise by means of them what are some other things that we learn about christ you mentioned there's so much theology in these psalms what are some other things we learn about christ and his work for us in the psalms i think we see very powerfully there the, the role of Christ in God reconciling himself to this world and to us. Right from the beginning in Psalm 2, there is the invitation from God to the Son, to the, the Son who's celebrated in that Psalm. You know, he says, I will tell of the decree, of the decree, the Lord said to me, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. But he goes on to say, Ask of me. And I will make the nations your inheritance, your heritage, the kings of the earth, your possession. So we see there this dynamic between uh, the father and incarnate son, really, the Messiah, wherein the, the, the Christ for 
the nations for us that that he might receive them and with that we might then be be brought into fellowship with God through his intercession through his request of of God the Father i think that's really really an important thing because by the end of it by the end of psalm 2 we're reading blessed are all who take refuge in him and we're invited to ask well who is the him here if you go back to who the him might be the most recent reference point is the son we take refuge in the Son, and thereby we find refuge in God, because the Son is God, <laughs> and you know, one with the Father. And so we actually have in Him our divine refuge. So I'd say that that's an important aspect that the Psalms bring out very richly. It's there from the very beginning of the of the book of Psalms, and that that kind of unfolds, you know, as we move into the Psalms further, as we see the kind of intercessory function of certain psalms that are interestingly attributed to David. David, of course, is the most obvious person we think of when we think of the psalms, but not all of the psalms are written by him. About half of them are, in fact, not quite half. Some of the psalms are written by the Levitical singers, be it Asaph or the, the, you know, the sons of Korah. We've even got one psalm by Moses. So they've got various authors when we think in terms of the individuals involved. And that means that the the Psalms of David are actually quite spread out and, and they count for roughly, roughly half of those Psalms. But where those Psalms of David are placed is very significant. And it's some of that that I want to unpack with attendees at the Institute because the use of these Psalms of David show forth David's role really as a type of the coming Christ. And they, they help us to see more clearly how how the coming Christ would indeed be an intercessor for God's people. This summer, the Institute on Liturgy, Preaching, and Church Music, July 9th through 12th, will assemble pastors, other church workers, church musicians, laity who who are interested in learning more about the Psalms as well all coming together in Seward, Nebraska. Tell us about what you're looking forward to in gathering with brothers and sisters in Christ to learn about the Psalms this summer. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the whole thing, to, to, to hearing the other speakers and, and getting the full richness. I'm, I'm just bringing one particular element to this, you know, the Psalter, its overview, getting a sense of the shape of the Psalms to bring us into the, the theology of the Psalms more deeply. But there's a lot more going on there as well that I'm really excited to listen to and, and learn from. Um, actually, I'll, I'll be doing a breakout as well, a, a sessional paper on the, uh, on the theme of a new song in the Psalms, which I'm, I'm really quite excited about because it's, it's a, a topic that I dealt with in some measure in my dissertation work and in my book, but, but this has given me an opportunity to be able to delve into that topic a little bit more. You know, you might recall the line, sing to the Lord a new song. Well, you find this a few times in the book of Psalms. And again, in some significant places, I want to explore with attendees what what that new song is and how it relates to our hymnody and, and all of that. So get to the heart of, of that, that kind of question. I'm looking forward to that as well. I'm looking forward to the fellowship and just all the learning that, that, that we can share in at this institute. I know we have like one minute left, but can you give us any more of a teaser on the new song? Because now I really want to know what that's all about. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I I suppose if you if you go to the Psalms in the 90s, like I'm thinking between 90 and 100, part of book four, we find a couple of new songs there in uh, Psalms 96 and 98, Sing to the Lord a New Song, and interspersed around those we have a few psalms that are, have a, a common uh, element to them in that they celebrate the kingship of god god is king yahweh is king the lord is king uh, in psalm 93 97 99 one of the main points i'll be making is that as we find these themes interspersed with one another again a product of the arrangement of the psalms and a bunch of other themes besides there is a lot in common with Moses' Song of the Sea after the Exodus in Exodus 15. So my point is going to be in a nutshell that the new song is for a new Exodus 
whereby Christ leads us out of death and that he gives us a song of thanksgiving, of, of praise to God who has delivered us from his Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Adam Hensley, Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. He is one of the keynote speakers at the Institute on Liturgy, Preaching, and Church Music, taking place July 9th through 12th in Seward, Nebraska. You can learn more by visiting lcms.org slash worship institute. Dr. Hensley, thank you so much for being our guest on the Coffee Hour today and helping us look at the Psalms. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.